Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Parkville Presbyterian Church, a place where everyone is loved and everyone belongs, a place where the Holy Spirit is moving, and sometimes it's disruptive, and that's okay. We praise God for the Holy Spirit, even when it's different from what our plans are, even when the wind blows in ways we're not expecting. Well, I am back after some time of dealing with COVID-19. As many of you know, uh, my family and I were in quarantine last week. We had to miss last Sunday. We didn't miss anything important, did we? (laughs) It was really hard to watch our 176th anniversary celebration as an online worshiper. I loved that I got to be there online and to connect with people online and to see what was happening. And I especially loved seeing how the leadership of our church stepped forward to participate in worship and to lead the way for us and to show us that even without the pastor here, even with a big event happening, We keep going, the church keeps moving. And so praise God for all of the people who stepped up in worship last Sunday. I wanna thank all the people who were helpful to my family over these past two weeks. Um, I can't tell you how many calls and texts I got checking in on us and praying for us and offering to bring us food and toys. Um, You all are an incredible congregation and we are blessed to be a part of it. I do wanna say, Given the time when the onset of COVID-19 symptoms happened for me, when I was here two Sundays ago, that would have been the time when I was most contagious. So two Sundays ago, when I was here, that was the time when I was most contagious. And none of you have contracted COVID-19. We haven't heard from anyone in the church office who's gotten the coronavirus, who's picked up COVID-19, And I think that's because we wear masks, because we have social distance, because the vaccine helps prevent us from contracting it. Of course, my wife and I are both fully vaccinated, and for us, the vaccine meant a less severe case of COVID than we might have experienced. But I am so thankful for the measures that we have in place. And I think they really showed their efficacy two weeks ago. When I was here as a contagious person, and none of y'all picked this up. So praise God for that. As we move into more general announcements, I wanna ask Herb Tillinghast to come forward to tell us about a special offering that'll be collected next week. Good morning. I'm a member of the risk-taking mission team, and one of the things we do is, uh, is I guess, promote the uh, three special, or four special offerings that the Presbyterian Church has each year. Uh, today, I'm here to promote the uh, Peace and Global Witness offering. Uh, it offers the uh, is an offering that the, where the church enables and promotes the peace of Christ by addressing systems of injustice in our communities and across the world. Uh, Parkville Presbyterian Church keeps 25% of the offering and uh, the mission team has selected GIFT, generating income for tomorrow, which uh, promotes uh, black-owned businesses and gives grants to to black-owned businesses. Please uh, refer to the Salt Shaker for more information and also for the the weekly uh, uh, PPC uh, newsletter. The other uh, portions of the offering are, uh, prom- I guess, are used by the church to also promote uh, and, and address injustice in the world. Uh, so thank you for participating in the Peace and Global Witness offering that will be dedicated next Sunday, that's October 3rd. Let us offer the peace of Christ in all times and in all ways. Thank you, Herb. One other announcement I'd like to make is on Tuesday at 6.30, there's a Parkville Living Center Town Hall. Parkville Living Center hosts a town hall meeting on the fourth Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. This is, I describe, one of the best kept secrets in Parkville. These monthly gatherings, which are, are meant to last just one hour, 
These monthly gatherings bring together people from people from our community who have influence, people who have knowledge, people who are doing important things, and brings them into conversation with a wider group of people. So if you are interested in community involvement, if you want to know more about what's happening in Parkville, Parkville Living Center Town Hall Forum is this Tuesday at 6.30. You can find more details on the third page of your bulletin. And now with all that said, we come together today to worship God, to know God more fully, to know God with each other. And so we call ourselves to worship using the words found in our bulletin. Please join me in the responsive call to worship found in your bulletin. Give ear, O people, to our teaching. Incline your ears to the words of our mouths. We will open our mouths in a parable. We'll utter dark sayings from of old, things we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, the mighty power of God, the wonders he has done. God is indeed mighty and glorious, but God has also descended to earth to live a frail, humble, and a human life among us. Therefore, we confess our sins. We do not confess to a high priest who is firmly above us, but to a trail guide who walks beside us and to a Messiah who has already assured us of forgiveness. With that in mind, let us confess our sins to the Lord, first using the prayer of confession printed in our bulletins and then in a holy moment of silent prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us life for the sake of living. You are the great I am. Mm. <clears throat> Prayer confession. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Against you, you alone, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach us wisdom in our secret hearts. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. Amen. God, thank you for your mercy. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
so glad you guys are here this morning. I want to ask you a question. I can ask the question to everybody here. Do you like ice cream? Yeah, yeah everybody likes ice cream. <laughs> well, there are, there are a lot of people that would agree with us. We all like ice cream, but it comes in a lot of different flavors. What's your favorite flavor, Malcolm? Chocolate. Chocolate. What's your favorite flavor, Henry? Cookies and cream. That sounds delicious. As, Esme, do you have a favorite flavor? Yeah, I got flavor ice cream. Well, okay. Rainbow ice cream. Well, that sounds delicious too. But did you know that even though we all agree we like ice cream, there are some really weird ice cream flavors out there. I looked them up online. I said, I typed in weird ice cream flavors. And here's what came up. Whiskey and cornflake, yeah. lobster, Eskimo, Eskimo ice cream. Oh, I love Mickey Mouse. He's great. Eskimo ice cream, which is made with reindeer fat. Yeah. Ew. I, I know. Beet and cucumber, broccoli. I love cucumbers. I love cucumbers too, but I don't want it in my ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> broccoli ice cream. Mm. Fig and turkey. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That look. I did say turkey. Ghost pepper. That's very hot. Yes. Pear and blue cheese. No. Foie gras ice cream, which is duck liver. <laughs> I know. I know. I felt the same way. Horseradish. Smoked salmon. Peanut butter and curry. And that one is served with a scorpion on top of it. Just, just for a little treat. Uh, there, there are, even though we can all agree we like ice cream, there are a lot of weird flavors. There's a, just a lot of flavors, good and bad, out there. Like ice cream? <laughs> yes. Now, I want to say, I think most of us could agree that church is good. I love coming to church. And as you guys grow older, you're going to learn that there's lots of different kinds of churches out there. There are some that have no musical, no musical instruments because they're not mentioned in the Bible. So they only sing. There are some that have no music at all. There are some that only want loud guitars and drums. There are some churches that make you wear special clothes. There are some churches that don't care what you wear. There are some that will let ministers, women be ministers, and there's some that won't. Some that would never let a woman be a minister. There are some that invite all people to worship, and there are some that keep certain people out. There's all different kinds of churches out there, even though we can agree that mostly church is good. And as you grow up, you might, you might find that <laughs> that train is very loud. As you grow up, you might find that you're more comfortable coming to a church kind of like you grew up in. But you might find something totally different out there that you like. Over the years, some people will say, my favorite ice cream is the best one and it's the only one. Some people will say, my church is right and everybody else is wrong. But just like ice cream that comes in lots of flavors, for the most part, we can say church is good. Sometimes it's divided, yes, and sometimes people scrap and fight about different things. But mostly it's good because the scripture says, and we're going to hear it in a little bit, that there is one body. It has many members. There is, you, you guys are part of that body that is the church. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one calling, one hope. And God is over it all and in it all and through it all. And God is what holds all of us together. Amen.
Scripture reading is a responsive reading from Psalm 78. Let us read the scripture together. God commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, rained down on the people manna to eat, and gave them the grain of heaven. Mortals ate the bread of angels. God sent them food in abundance. The Lord made the east wind blow in the heavens, and by his power led out the south wind. God rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. Our God let quail fall within their camp, all around their dwellings. And the people ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. Our second reading is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. In the early days of Christianity, the church in Ephesus was, like many of the other new congregations, located in urban centers throughout the Mediterranean basin, the church in Ephesus was struggling to find a sense of unity. In Ephesus, the communal argument was around spiritual gifts and roles in the church. Who had superior spiritual gifts? Whose role was the most important? In our reading, Paul calls the church from division into unity, from division into a unity that recognizes the contributions and giftedness of each person, a unity that does not flatten out our differences or call us to hold our tongues. No, the unity described here is an earned unity, an earned unity that comes through hard work and honesty and striving together. Understanding that the things we work the hardest for are the things that bring us the most joy. 
So Paul doesn't ask us to flatten out our differences. Instead, he celebrates our diversity. And he doesn't call us to hold our tongues. In fact, a little after our reading, he recognizes that anger will be part of the community's life together. But he says, be angry, but do not sin. In our reading, he calls for speaking the truth in love, even though it is not always easy to balance truth and love. But it's only by so doing that we can build one another up, that we can call each other to growth according to the full measure of the stature of Christ. In Christian community, we accept others and accept ourselves as we are, but we also keep striving to become more and more like Jesus. Our second reading balances all of those tensions in a holistic vision of Christian life. Our scripture reading is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. So far in our current worship series, we have covered nearly 18 centuries of church history. We have been telling the story of the church, and not just our particular church, but the universal church that began when Christ died and was resurrected in 32 AD and continues into the present time, continues as it lives in our hands and feet, in our bones and souls. In our worship series, we have visited the early church of the first few centuries, an outlawed church that nonetheless spread like wildfire. We have visited the medieval church, a period of corruption and reform, of sin and grace, of drawing near to God in theology, music and art, and falling away again with opulence and greed and brutality. We have visited the Reformation Church, a church that sought a pure vision of what the Christian faith could be, but that also became so enraptured with purity that it burdened the freedom of others and imposed its own vision with force. As Presbyterians, we are of a group that emerged from the Reformation, and at times we evince the worst tendencies of the Reformation churches, but we also have a lot to be proud of. We were freedom fighters in Europe and freedom fighters in the American colonies. We fought in the American Revolution. We signed the Declaration of Independence. We seeded this new nation with ideas about how to govern that it continues to hold as bedrock principles. In every era, whether it's the history of our congregation, or the wider body of Presbyterians, or the wider body of the people of God over the course of the past two millennia, 
there have been beautiful moments to be proud of and devastating moments of sin. And that, that is the way of Christianity. As Christians, we demonstrate the best and worst of what it means to be human. The best and worst of what it means to represent God in the world. Because we are broken people living in a broken world. And imperfection is the best we can do. We are made in the image of God. So we strive for wholeness. We strive for virtue. We strive to live as our second reading in tones according to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. But none of us have it all figured out. None of us are Jesus himself. None of the people in history had it all figured out. And so as part of the Christian journey, we find ourselves wrestling back and forth with ourselves, wrestling with broken, brokenness and harmony, wrestling with vice and virtue, all in here, all just as part of our own spiritual struggle. But all of that is part of our spiritual journey. And so, too, is confessing our sins to God, receiving forgiveness, and starting again so we may try again to grow into maturity, into fully developed people who are part of a body of Christ woven together by God. This morning, we explore the history of Presbyterians in the United States of America. This morning, we pick up the story after 1776 and the founding of a new nation. In those early years, Presbyterians were one of the largest denominations in the country. Alongside Methodists, Baptists, and Congregationalists, Presbyterians led the way for people of faith in America. We were a growing church, a socially and politically influential church. We sent future pastors to Princeton and Yale for a theological education, and then sent them out west as the borders of the new nation expanded. But there was some dissension. In the early 1800s, there was a movement of Presbyterian ministers calling for adult baptism instead of infant baptism. A movement of ministers calling for congregations to have more direct democratic control of their own life and work, and for all Christians to shed denominational labels and come together in unity. This movement became the Disciples of Christ a denomination we still partner with today because despite our differences, we have a lot in common. In 1810, another group left the denomination. These members disagreed with the church's teachings on predestination, and so they left and became the Cumberland Presbyterians, a denomination that's still active today, mostly in the Southeast United States. In the 1890s, there were controversies over modernism and fundamentalism. In the late 19th century, questions about science, faith, human purpose, and human progress roiled many American churches. One response to this was to adopt the teachings of modern science, to integrate them with the teachings of faith. Some of these integrationists may have gone too far and lost their faith altogether. Other believers chose not to integrate faith and science at all not to give a single inch to what they saw as the insidious crawl of modernism. Instead, these, these believers developed fundamentalism, a set of theological principles based on a strict, literal reading of the Bible, and rejecting any teaching, secular or religious, that contradicts those principles. If you're ever in a conversation with someone, and they try to present fundamentalism as the traditional way of reading the Bible, if you're ever in a conversation with someone and they try to present fundamentalism as the traditional way of reading the Bible, or as the purest, proper way of reading the Bible, know that they are incorrect. The early Christians did not interpret the Bible literally, and they would disagree with the fundamentalists on a number of points. The same can be said for medieval Christians and the reformers of the Protestant Reformation. Fundamentalism grew up in the late 1800s as a specific response to modernism and scientific progress. It was a way of saying to the scientific community and to the rest of the secular world, if you're examining the natural world with scientific rigor, 
will apply that same kind of rigor to an exhaustive reading and interpretation of scripture. We'll read it objectively. We'll take it literally. So let me say again, fundamentalism is not traditional Christianity. It grew up in the late 1800s. And it took the Presbyterian Church four decades to formally split over it. But in 1936, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church was founded. And what other Presbyterian groups are out there? There's the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and the Presbyterian Church in America, two denominations that emerged between the 1960s and the 1980s to uphold stricter interpretations of the Bible. The Evangelical Presbyterians and the Presbyterian Church in America are not fundamentalists like the Orthodox Presbyterians, but they are slower than other Presbyterians to move with societal trends. And by the way, if you feel like I'm mentioning a lot of groups, I'm only mentioning like 5% of the Presbyterian denominations out there. So I'm, I'm giving you the highlights, really. Um, in our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, people are allowed to remarry after a divorce. And we are glad to ordain women. And we are glad to include LGBT people in the life and leadership of the church. But those are matters of controversy in these other denominations. The Presbyterian Church in America does not ordain women to serve as deacons, elders, or pastors. The Evangelical Presbyterian Church leaves the ordination of women up to individual church bodies who are allowed to make their own decision on the subject. Interestingly enough, there are movements within these two denominations to loosen things up a bit, to allow for more freedom in interpreting the Bible and more inclusive practices for the life of the church. It's not uncommon for women and LGBT people to grow up in those denominations, feel called to ministry, find that their path to life and leadership in the church is blocked, and then move over to our group, the Presbyterian Church USA, so they can live out their callings from God. But other people choose to stay and work for change in the church bodies they grew up in. And if I had to bet, I would imagine that it's only a matter of time before these denominations shift their thinking on biblical teaching in response to what their eyes are seeing, in response to what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world and who God is calling, but time will tell. So far, the, by far the most enduring split within the denomination, looking back at our, at our whole history within the United States, the most enduring split within the denomination occurred over slavery. So far in today's sermon, we've talked about infant baptism, we've talked about church governance, we've talked about predestination, fundamentalism, social change, but the biggest and most enduring split in our denomination occurred because of slavery. In 1837, three presbyteries, and a presbytery is a regional body of the wider church. In 1837, three presbyteries were expelled from the denomination voted out, excommunicated, because they favored the abolition of slavery. These new school presbyteries were expelled from the denomination because they favored abolition. After 1837, both old school and new school Presbyterians sent ministers to the frontier and established churches on the western edge of the country, and Parkville Presbyterian Church, founded in 1845, was one of those congregations. Now, if you've been following our worship series, you know that George Park, one of our founders, was an abolitionist. And this, so it may not surprise you to learn that this was a new school congregation back in 1845. In 1861, as the nation split into two and fought a civil war over slavery, slavery the main body of Presbyterians split again. Several northern churches joined the new school congregations and formed a new denomination, while the southern churches formed a pro-slavery denomination that sided with the Confederates. This split persisted from 1861 until 1983, 122 years. Long after the Civil War ended, long after the question of slavery was settled, this split persisted in the church 
Because once you're pulled apart, no matter what the original reason was for the split, it's hard to come back together. In the lives of churches and in the lives of individuals, once you're pulled apart from someone, even if the original presenting issue changes, you start inventing reasons to maintain the split. You start inventing reasons to maintain the difference. You know, back when it happened, you never apologized. You know, you don't respect us. If we come back together, we'll have to change our leadership. We'll have to change our headquarters. We'll have to change a lot of other things, and we're comfortable with the way things are. It's too hard to reunify, even if we wanted to, and I'm not saying we do. We'd have to swallow our pride, and that's a hard pill to swallow. If you've ever felt emotionally distant from someone you were once close to, if there's ever been a major breach or conflict in your family, you know how those splits can endure beyond reason. You know how humans can invent justifications to say, this is my tribe and that's your tribe and we're just different and we're not going to see eye to eye. I've seen people split like this within a family. Even though they may see each other on Thanksgiving and Christmas, there's an emotional distance there. There's a sense that that group of family members is different from this group. And so there's a split in our hearts, even as we're eating from the same turkey. And I've seen people split like this within a church, not just within a denomination, but within an individual congregation, where people worship in the same space on Sunday morning, but there's emotional distance there. There's a sense that that group of members is different from this group of members. There's a split in our hearts, even though we worship the same God in the same space. So what do we do about those emotional divisions? What do we do about that distance in the heart? The two main bodies of Presbyterians in the United States, the Northern Church and the Southern Church, the New School and the Old School, reunited in 1983 after 122 years apart, 122 years of distance. And so how did they manage to do that? How did they manage to come together again after all that time? They started with small steps. In areas where both church bodies existed, there were union presbyteries that brought churches together years before the denomination as a whole reunited. Our area was one of the areas that paved the way. This church was part of a union presbytery prior to 1983. There were also congregations who cooperated with each other, working together on common mission and fellowship. There were also lots of conversations about finding a new denominational headquarters for the unified group rather than choosing between the two centers of the existing groups. There were long discussions about merging leadership and affirming a common set of beliefs. One of the things they decided to do was to create a new statement of faith to mark the reunification, a new statement of faith to affirm the doctrines they held in common. They chose a committee comprised equally of members of both group, groups, and that committee worked for eight years. That committee worked for eight years. You know, I, I, I don't mind rolling with all the vagaries of being outside. You know, the wind blows, things move around, there's train sounds and plane sounds and car sounds. I don't mind all that. But when I'm building up to something, <laughs> could we cool that a bit? I was trying to get somewhere with this. <laughs> a committee comprised equally of members of both groups. And that committee worked for eight years to iron out its differences and compose a brief statement of faith, a beautiful and poetic rendering of classic theology and new theology, of honoring the Bible and affirming the movement of the Holy Spirit within the world. 
the statement, a brief statement of faith, is 552 words, and it took eight years to work it out. 552 words, eight years. But that is a marker of the hard work it takes to come together again after a division has occurred. That is a marker of the spiritual and emotional work it takes to come back together after a division. So again, what do we do about the divisions in our own lives? What do we do about the splits in our own hearts, about the people we have dismissed and the people who have dismissed us? In the fourth chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul would remind us that our tribe, however we conceive of the difference between our tribe and their tribe, however we think of us and them, our tribe is not superior to anyone else's. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and in all and through all. Therefore, Paul begs us to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He recognizes that this effort toward unity will not be easy, that we will at times be driven to anger, and so he tells us, be angry, but do not sin. And he urges us to be honest with one another. Speaking the truth in love, he says, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And the more we can do that, the more we will be united and the more we will grow in faith. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Though we may at times experience division, though we may at times experience a split within our own hearts, even with people we see physically all the time, there can be an emotional distance, but even with that, there is a way forward. It's not simple, it's not quick, but the more we work at it, the more fruit we see. The more we work at it, Thank God for the train whistle keeping everybody safe. You know, praise God for that warning. Praise God for for that signal. Though we may at times experience division, there is a way forward. It's not simple. It's not quick. But the more we work at it, the more fruit we see. The more we work at it, the more unity we experience. The more we work at it, the more we are filled with joy and love, and the more we are able to grow up until, as Paul says, all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the full stature of Jesus Christ. There's a key phrase in that. Until all of us until all of us come to the full stature of Christ, all of us. Because that lofty goal, it's not something we can attain on our own. It can only come to us by working together. Amen.
as we return to outside worship on these cool Sundays of the fall, obviously there are kinks we're still trying to work out. One of them would be to make sure that we print all the words of the hymn. <laughs> One of them would be to uh, set up some wind screens to just uh, keep the wind out. Uh, maybe we could work with the train operators and change some of the train schedules. That'd be helpful as well. It's part of the hard work of being in community. It's part of the hard work of being a church body. We don't always get it right the first time, but each week we confess to God, each week we receive forgiveness, each week we strive again and try again. Each week we keep doing the hard work of being a community with each other. Even though it's hard and we make mistakes and we're not sure how it goes, we keep striving and we keep working. As we come to this time of prayer, are there joys that you would like to lift up in prayer? Do you have a joy that you'd like to share? Yes, Marcia? Marcia gives thanks to the professional and lay leadership of the church who helps to make all this happen, setting up sound systems, setting up the cross, setting up communion, setting up the chairs. It's a lot of work each Sunday. I think it's worth it to stay safe. It's worth it to be in this natural place and experiencing the beauty of God's creation. It takes a lot of people to make it happen, and we give thanks to God for them. Thank you, Marcia. What other joys might we lift up today? Uh, yes, Janet. I would like to give a special welcome and thanks for the presence of a long, long, long time in our friend of Russia. We were up in the same room, we went to school together, and they brought them forward. And they moved away from us, but never left us in our best part. We came back this weekend to all this reunion, and it has been so much fun, so much joy, and so many people to get us all together. Here he is this morning. <laughs> Amen. We give thanks for Bud Gresham in town for a 50th high school reunion at Park Hill and visiting us in church today, visiting us in the church he grew up in. We praise God for the connections that continue through the distance of time. Is there anything I missed back here? Okay. Are there concerns that you'd like to lift up? Are there prayer? Yes, Randy. A close friend of Randy's son Griffin and, and his wife Steph, um, a close friend's father has COVID and has a, had a stroke as well. And so we pray for Jake's father. We pray that healing will come for him. We pray in the road to recovery that God will be with him and bring him to a place of recovery. For whom else might we pray? Uh, yes, Joyce. Thank you. We pray for Joyce's son's car for recovery for the car. <laughs> I think we might pray for our friend Glenn's car as well since he's having some some troubles. So pray for all cars who are in need of healing. Thank you, Joyce. Are there any others we might lift up this morning? Let us continue in prayer. God, we give you thanks for gathering us together and thanks for the gifts you give us each day. We pray that you would bless us with your love, bless us with your presence, bless us with your hopeful eye on the world. Help us to see each other as you see us, as creatures who are made in your image, as creatures who have 
good intentions, as creatures who are bonded together with us, even when we feel like we are not the same. Lord, we pray that you will continue to draw us together in your spirit, continue to draw us together in the unity of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit. We pray for those we know who are in need of your healing. We pray for Joyce's son and for his transportation needs. We pray for Jake and Amanda's father for healing. We pray for these and many others, knowing that you are a God of healing and a spirit of love, knowing that as surely as you knit us together in Christ, so you also knit together our bodies and our souls and our spirits. And so we pray for the healing only you can bring, emotional and spiritual and physical. We pray for all of us to be knit together, for all those we know to be knit together. And we pray for us to be knit together with each other, that as we grow with the Spirit, we may grow together. And we ask this in your Son's name. Amen. In churches like the one in Ephesus, in churches like the one in Ephesus that Paul wrote to, in the early Christian communities, each time they gathered together, each week they celebrated communion because they knew that whatever other differences they had, whatever arguments they were having about spiritual gifts, whatever differences in ethnicity or class or any of the other things that might have separated them in any other sphere of the world, they knew that in the church there was one thing that could bind them together, and it was Jesus Christ. And Jesus was symbolized for them at this table as a loaf of bread that gets broken the way his body was broken as a cup that is poured out the way the substance of his life was poured out. They found Jesus at this table, and they, know, they knew that by finding Jesus at the same place and together, that they were then bonded together, and that they could then move forward together, whatever else might have separated them in any other sphere of life. And so each time they gathered, they would remember the words that Jesus spoke on the Thursday before the Sunday when he rose again in resurrection. He was having supper with his closest friends, and during a moment in the meal, he lifted up a loaf of bread and he gave thanks, saying, This is my body, which is for you. As often as you share bread together, remember me. In the same way, he took a cup and poured it out. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in the substance of my life. As often as you share this cup together, remember me. If you are worshiping with us online, this would be the time to take out your own bread, to take out your own juice, to enjoy communion at home. If you don't have bread or juice, find something else to break and to pour, and to remember that you are with Jesus and that you are with us as well. If you are here worshiping in person, you do not need to come forward for communion. If you choose to remain in your seat for any reason, you may participate in communion spiritually without participating physically, that's all right. If you do come forward, the table is here where you'll find pre-sliced -pre bread, pre-poured cups, prepared by gloved attendants, COVID safe. You'll find that there. And you'll find there that symbolism of what Christ calls us to, that symbolism of the unity of us coming together. And again, if you choose to stay seated and experience it spiritually, that's fine. But physically, you can experience it here. Let us join together in communion.
Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of your love. Thanks for the gift of your grace. Thanks for the gift of this bread that fills us up, for this juice that quenches our thirst, for reminding us each week that we are filled by you, that we are nurtured by you, that we are cared for by you, so that we may go forth as a sent and called people, filled with you to fill others in turn, filled with your love that we may spread that love to the world. Lord, we give you thanks for this gift and pray that you will empower us to spread that gift to a world in need. And Lord, we pray this using the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you are called to give a financial gift to the work of the church this morning, that gift is appreciated. We know that all of us give various gifts every day. All of us are gifted by God, and we in turn give gifts of time and love and energy. We in turn give gifts of ourselves to the people around us. If you are called to also give a financial gift, there is an offering plate over here on my, on my right on your left by the bouquet of flowers. If you are an online worshiper, you might find an online offering plate at our website at parkvillepresby.org. We are grateful for the gifts God gives us each day, grateful for the opportunity to give back to God, that we may be a part of the good work God is doing in the world. Now, friends, we come to a final hymn for the day. I have checked and made sure this is a one-page hymn, so you do have all the words in front of you. And I'm going to remind you that the whole reason we decided to come outside in the fall was so that we could sing together. So I really want to hear you on this last one. The words are there. The opportunity's there. If, if you don't sing well and you embarrass yourself, we're all going to leave soon anyway. So uh, let's go ahead and really sing it out. Friends, if you are able to stay and help us to store this worship space, to store these chairs and accoutrements, we'll be very grateful for that. Many hands make light work. Friends, as you go forth today, may you go forth in peace, bonded in unity, bonded by the Holy Spirit, bonded in the ligaments of the body of Christ that joins us together, that we may all grow together as one body, one spirit, moving into the full stature of the measure of Jesus Christ. Amen. May go in peace. <laughs>